And today, so we have a, a huge book, Land of Liberty, and it's been described as the greatest of, of yeah, that's the one. Of, of all your works and it's it's very recent and and and, and so let's um you tell us about it <laughs> well you know i when i wrote it it was after writing many other books about this work i've done for a quarter century and i wanted to step back even more and really almost uh i didn't call it this or anything but it's like war and peace Tolstoy tried to summarize great historic events through the lens and the eyes of particular families in Russia. And I've done the same with my family. So what this book is, mm -hmm. it's fiction, but it's really not fiction. It's based on real people, real events. Uh, some of it conjecture, but talking about the past, present, and future in our Annette family. The past, my ancestor Philip Annette there on the wall, who came to Canada from England with his family. That's his father, Robert Anna there. Robert was a British officer who had fought at Waterloo and the British government gave free land to British officers who were retired. And so Robert got 300 acres of land in Southern Ontario. And they all moved there in the 1820s. They had to get out of England because they were Baptists and they weren't allowed to practice. So, you know, religious dissidents for many centuries fleeing to Canada or moving to Canada. Ironically, his son, Philip, take us, takes up arms and uh, takes part in the rebellion against the British crown in 1837. Mm -hmm. So the first part of the book is about Philip and it, his involvement in, in the insurrection, but also his conflict with his father, who's a very conservative, you know, crown loving British officer who they're on two sides of a civil war. And, uh, the second part is my story today in the present time mm -hmm. and really looking at the whole issue of the genocide from the from a longer view that is really what we talk about the corporatocracy this corporate tyranny that's taken over the world um, got started by the genocide against indigenous people and the third part of the story is the future what would happen if our republic of canada triumphed mm -hmm. but then we're in a the, so it's talking about the in the future the republic in canada at and a huge war with this China-led corporatocracy. And, um, and so it really spans hundreds of years, but it's looking at, again, all these issues. I, I right at the beginning, I say, um, the purpose of this novel is to ask, how did we come to the present tyranny and how might we overcome it from the point of view of the Annett family? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in a nutshell what mm -hmm. I did, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's epic. And it's it's from uh, an amazingly, you know, uh, expansive pers perspective, and and very much to do with on the ground. And I mean that the 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 generations of the Annett family, um, your story is running right through it. And the the uh, that uh, the other book that we talked about, Land of No One, it, it's it's you know there's not one of your works is 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 it, 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 you are you are part of that story, and um, and 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 we, and and it's a kind of a um, it's a part of this very land of liberty, the whole thing because if you know oh, yeah. if it wasn't for that that COVID tyranny, um, the, the, the 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 you know the um, it, it couldn't have happened without that reign of of terror on the children. And it all began there. Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, in the story, I tie together my story and Philip's story very personally, because in the story, Philip Anna takes part in the rebellion. His father saves his life because his father has connections with a guy called General Colburn, who led the British forces that crushed the rebellion. Colburn and Robert Annett had fought together at Waterloo. And so Robert goes to Colburn after and pleads for the life of his son, who's a hunted rebel, because after the rebellion was uh, crushed, people were hanged, deported to Australia, uh, Tasmania, and hundreds of Canadian rebels were sent there. And they were hunting people like Philip Bennett. Well, his dad, Robert, made a deal with Colburn in exchange for sparing Philip's life. They were turn over the Chippewa Indians they knew, 
because in the area around Watford, where my family uh, emigrated to in southwest Ontario, the the Crown was hunting down Chippewa Indians and putting them, guess where? In this facility called, we call the Mushole, the Mohawk School, which started out right in the same year the rebellion was crushed. They opened the, the, the Mohawk Indian School as an experimental center. And I describe how they were scooping up Native uh, people, not only to drive them off their land and kill them en masse, but to take the children, put them in this Mohawk school for experimental purposes, uh, mm -hmm. trying out all these torture and, and you know, mind control devices. Mm -hmm. Even back in the 1800s, they were doing it. We've got that from eyewitnesses. So mm -hmm. karmically, what happens is Philip and the Annets gained their life. I'm here today because he at the expense of the Chippewa Indians who he turned over, they were friends with them. And he, he agreed to, uh, you know, allow them to be gathered up, uh, even though they were, they, they had sanctuary on his land. Mm -hmm. That was the price he paid for his life. Mm -hmm. And it haunted him. He passed on to mm -hmm. his descendants. And even though I didn't know about that, there I am at the mush hole doing the dig, uh, uncovering the remains of these children, almost, you know, the, the, the spirit, uh, carrying on in me to try to get justice to overcome this historical wrong we had been involved in, this mm -hmm. genocide that we had participated in, and yet fighting against. So showing that that shadow and light in every family mm -hmm. is something Canadians can't do because they refuse mm -hmm. to look at that shadow and light within themselves. Yes, so I kind of shone in a, a spotlight on that within our own Anna family. Right? Every yeah. family, every family has their hidden... And going back to Tolstoy, um, War and Peace, um, I, not that I've read it, but, you know, that that, that all of life um, is about conflict. And and so then you've got this amazing moment in, that you're describing where um, his his wife, um, it, it, she she confronts him, doesn't she, about it. It's, it's just so moving and gripping and devastating. And Well, that's right. The... Uh... You know, like Philip, whose life was saved by this deal. He didn't know about it till, till much later. Robert had made the deal, his father, because there was this uh, Native woman who had taken sanctuary on their land. Her name was Gizi. And three, she and her three children were hiding out from um, these these crown posses were going out, just wiping out any Chippewa Indians they found. There was a monopoly called the Canada Company, owned by this thing called the Family Compact. It's like this oligarchy that was running... Canada still does, right? And um, so they 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 needed Indians, and so they Philip didn't know that his life had been bought through the sacrifice of these Chippewa Indians who had befriended them. Um, oh. And then later, Robert's wife confronts him and said, "You know, we're going to carry this." In our family, we you know she was a very devout Baptist woman. She said, mm -hmm. "You can't do this wrong," and and not reverberate one generation mm. to the next because we're part of the blood is on our hands and you mm. can't wash it away mm. and uh, that's just so like today people think oh we issue an apology and things are fine i mean that's lying to ourselves it's fooling ourselves because you got to go into the roots and find out where it started mm. the blood on our hands face mm. it mm. and then maybe there'll be some kind of change so this is how we're trying to do it within our family um mm. by looking at this and it's a very lonely thing to do because nobody wants to do it Right. In my family, I'm the only one. My father and I are the only ones <laughs> willing to look at this in the whole Annette family, right? So this is Bill, your father. My father, yeah, there he is on the wall. That's yes. Bill and me. My dad. Yes. Right? Yes. That's his dad. Okay, I should show you that. <laughs> That's oh. dad and me in the middle. This yes. is Ross Ann and my grandfather. Wow. That's uh Philip Annett over there. Mm. And up there, that's my uncle Bob, my dad's brother who died in the war. Um, the great and, sacrifice, uh, mm. family sacrifice. Yes. Mm. That's right. So, I mean, you know, it, it's yeah. an attempt to, to make, make it personal, which you've got to do with any great event. Mm -hmm. You've got to bring it down to earth and see how we're all part of the story. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I it, it's funny too, the, the other Annette we talk about is, Peter Annett, the philosopher in, he was a free thinker and philosopher in England before that in the 1700s. And he got arrested, put in jail when he was 70 for writing these 
they're called the Free Inquirer. Um, he questioned the Bible. He said, could Jesus really perform miracles? Let's talk about this. Let's reason it out. Uh, and he was accused of the crown of blasphemous libel, where you, if you challenge the doctrines of the Christian church, specifically the Church of England, you can go to the slammer for it, which is what happened to him. Uh, but right at the beginning of this, written in 1769, uh, Peter wrote, and this could be my words, we shall expose the hidden works of darkness and drive mm -hmm. falsity to the bottomless pit. That's exactly what I've oh, been doing. But I know. I just it's love the re reverberation. Mm -hmm. that spirit reverberating down mm -hmm. through the generations and you don't know about this till you engage in it yourself and then you realize wait a minute there's a whole family drama playing itself out here right so he 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 was consciously aware as he wrote that about his own family is that i don't know I, I very little is known about peter on it uh except he was uh put in the I stocks there's that. the records mm -hmm. of his trial uh, he'd been born in Liverpool. He was a dissenting clergyman who left the ministry, like I did, to be an itinerant free thinker. He lived in London. He was part of the Robin Hood Society, which was kind of a free thinking radical group. Wow. Um, they, a lot of these guys were locked up, the publications banned, you know, because if you challenge the church, you're challenging the crown. Church and state are like that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so Kevin he was being political. He was being political. He didn't even realize it because he was taking on the church and the state, both like I did, right? With the Rose School Amazing. Genocide Amazing. Campaign. Way back then. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. And and that doc that 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 um document is the original document. Wow. The, oh, these articles. The, what these are. This was published fifty years after he died. This is from eighteen twenty six. Wow. And these are reproductions of the essays he wrote, Free Inquirer. And the guy was really funny. I mean, oh. to give you an example, he, he he's a deist like Thomas Jefferson and the others. He said, there's no God up in the sky, we, but we all have a divine faculty, which is called reason. Mm -hmm. God, Reason is God within us. And so how can reason conflict with the will of God? They agree with each other. So he said, for example, there was a humorous article he wrote about the, the plagues of Egypt in the in the Old Testament. <laughs> He said, you know, when God brings forth these plagues on the people of Egypt, um, when he made frogs fall from the sky, he said, well, if that had have happened in France, the French wouldn't have any, any problem with it. They would have just stewed them up, uh, frog legs in their stew, right? Like, why? He, he used humor all the time to kind of poke fun at all these austere English bishops. And he got very personal. Uh, there was a guy, Thomas Sherlock, he was the Bishop of London, and he went after this guy. He had a score to settle with the clergy, right? Uh, just like I do, right? <laughs> and he said, like, he, he would name this guy and go after him and call him names. And so Bishop uh, Sherlock hired these goons to find Peter on his printing press, like they did, you know, uh, with the rebels in Upper Canada. Smash the printing press, beat him up, throw him in prison. Just the same kind of repression. It's different now the way they do it, but it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Church and state mm -hmm. are part mm -hmm. of the same crime and they cannot mm -hmm. be criticized. Mm. when you come down to it right mm. so i mean it's all in the family genes right <laughs> oh yeah sure and a part of this for me is to do with you know this theme of um it's you don't hear it much uh, this term ver very often these days but stigmatization so you know anyone who's a rebel they find a way of like you know so that um you're going to be um uh, made uh, like blacklisted by in any way possible, and that that justifies oh, yeah. you being murdered and and the, and it was happened way back then. And there was another an, another fellow with that spirit that you mentioned with the printer that that was also thrown into the canal, you know. But he kept going. Well, Eli that's William Lyon Lyon McKenzie. McKenzie. He was the leader in one of the leaders of the, there were two parts of Canada. What's now Ontario was called Upper Canada and Lower Canada was Quebec. And there were simultaneous uprisings in both areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one in English Canada got defeated very quickly. But William Lyon Mackenzie led that. He was a Scotsman mm -hmm. who had been, uh, he had come penniless from Scotland, but he heard about this family compact and he went after them tooth and nail. He set up his own newspaper called the, the Colonial Advocate. 
he was denouncing the family compact members by name because it was all one family. They were they were the attorney general, the bishop, uh, church, state, big money, the bankers. They were all part of the big cabal running Canada like now. Right. Um, and he went after these guys personally and they would hire goons to go. He would have to even though Mackenzie had nine children, uh, he had to sleep in a different place every night to avoid assassination. Three times the farmers of uh, Ontario elected him to the colonial legislature. Three times they got thrown out by the family compact. He'd walk in, bar him, right? And he was just tenacious. And he eventually, after the rebellion, there was a price on his head. He went down to, to America as an exile, eventually came back. He was the first mayor of Toronto. Uh, he, he's the one who invented the name Toronto. It used to be called York. Uh, and then he, you know, as a sign of, you know, we should be self-governing, he brought in this name Toronto. And his house is still in downtown Toronto. It's kind of preserved as a museum. Mm -hmm. But uh, very little few people know about who this guy was, even though his grandson became a prime minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King, during World War II, oh, was the really? prime minister, his grandson. Oh, and yet wow. the grandfather is all forgotten about. That's kind of the rebellious history we don't want to hear about. Just probably the way 100 years from now, I'll be remembered. You know, kind of like, let's not talk about Kevin. You know, he's too controversial. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Yeah, yeah. You know, how? so getting back to what this book is all about, and how, how do we right. arrive at this this tyranny? So now we're at the point of the... Um, you know, totalitarianism, the 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 police state, COVID police state. And yeah. um it's the same game, isn't it, Kevin, being played yeah. out. You know, we've this this incredible book, um, you know, you, I mean it's incredible for, for for many reasons, but but because you go into this in such detail and um and you know I'm I'm tempted to if I may uh, go back to the the element in it um, that that covers the experience for the for the Indians, the the, yeah. the natives, um, and this woman Gizzy, who's who's basically like she she was the one survivor with her ch children, three children. Um, the rest of them were incinerated. You know, they literally were hunting them down. They were. Then after the uh, she's thrown on the fire, just like over here in Australia, they they were made to make their own pile. They were called pile, uh, build their own fire, and then they were you know uh, burnt on the fire. And and uh, one at least of the, her children witnessed that. They got to flee. Uh, don't think they all did, but um, anyway. But that that um, the 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 ch children were they burnt the forests to, to 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 get them out to flush them out that's how desperate they were to get them into this thing but well, that's she, the thing that's the thing that canadians don't understand you know that they've erased that whole part of their memory they they never even taught it of course but even if they were taught it they wouldn't accept it because what literally happened during that time was there were hunting parties and they just hunt native people to death and uh that's why in the story the Yanets give sanctuary to Gizzy and her children and then sell them out to save Philip's life. But mm. um, the point is that that was the norm. Uh, that's why there were so few Native people left in Eastern mm. Canada. They, mm. they, and they didn't, you see the genocide spanned centuries. It, it didn't get complete till the 1900s on the West Coast as Canada moved, moved West with the railway. And so the phases of genocide were, were slower in a way. It happened over two, three years. But um, th that reality is the same. First, you wipe out most of them. Then you can corral most of them in, in on reservations and Indian schools. And then gradually, you just let them die off, which is pretty much what's happened. Uh, yeah. There is no native identity left. They're not occupying their own lands. They're totally exterminated, just as is happening to us now. So, you know, it's it's the same process. And um, and here in Australia, um, as, you, as you reminded us, too, that... Um, yeah, that corralling of the re the remaining ones, uh, because it was a free for all, you know, hunting party, and and, um, and these these fellows here, uh, the the Saskatchewan, this this massacre happened only recently, you know, as as well. It's a sign you know, of of how it still carries on. They were they were the ten Cree people in that picture mm -hmm. were in the way of Rio Tinto mining. 
mm. crown owned China affiliated company. Mm. And mm. the chief Wally Burns was against it. So they hire a killer. He kills seven of his family members in one night. Mm. And, uh, you know, as a warning to the rest. So it's still happening as we speak. Yeah, because but, because they well, just I, they just happen to be um, their land just happens to be above, you know, what is it, trillions of dollars worth of diamonds. <laughs> diamonds. Right. In Saskatchewan. Now, the point is, it's easy to focus on these dramatic aspects of the genocide. But the point in the book where it's all leading in the end of the book is what is this corporatocracy that the new republic is battling with? It's it. It, it controls through a process uh, in the book we call techno formation, where the human brain is integrated into a computer network. So literally become part of a machine. The human race is exterminated. We're just extensions of a machine now. That was the whole purpose of the experiments and the genocide on the native people to develop an, this technology. So the Republic is really fighting a, a huge uh, attack on, on the, the final stage of the extermination of the human race. And um, my daughter is one of the leaders of the New Republic. Oh. Uh, and my, my, her name is Adele in the book. And um, she, you know, she keeps the memory. She has a son called Philip who wants to know all about me, her, his granddad. And my whole memory is being eradicated in, in, as is happening now. You ask people nowadays who Kevin Annett is, there's either unawareness That's or- right. you know, and, That's right. But she's kept the memory of me alive. And my grandson in the future, Philip, uh, carries on the tradition. He yeah. battles. He carries on the fight after the Republic's been crushed. Mm -hmm. He's part of this underground movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, he carries the family tradition on. That's mm -hmm. kind of like the conclusion of the book, mm -hmm. kind of an open-ended, well, what's next, people? It's in your hands, right? That, yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed how you, the author, did that. So, um, you know, because the wheel was still in turn. Yeah, never, mm. never stops. Mm. And uh, so that's kind of it was it was great fun writing it. You know, I wrote it last year and uh, it, it the point is, you know, you reach now in my mid 60s, you, you, you got the sense that you've got to pass on the, the essence of what you struggled for your whole life. And uh, it wasn't just me. I'm carrying on a long family tradition that will carry on after me. Right. And, and and when you when you have that sense of being part of that continuity, yeah, you're never you're never defeated because you know it's going to carry on, right? It's a it's an incredible gift actually for us to be bequeathed this work because there's so you know like in terms of the trajectory, um, who yeah. in the who in the future is even going to be able to have the brain in here to and the feelings to be able to grasp. To well, be able to grasp a, the legacy. Exactly. You know? Like, even if it may not be many, as a matter of fact, you know, it isn't many right now. But the, the point is, I'll tell you how I found this book. I got it 40 years ago when I was an undergraduate at the University of British Columbia. I was walking through the stacks one day and I come across, whoa, Peter Annett. Who's Peter Annett? I didn't know about him because oh. the guy being eradicated, we had kind of a family, a rumor about him. But I find his book. And so I say, and this is an admission to the UBC liberalism. Yeah, I took the book because <laughs> wow, I let it gather dust on a shelf when I can be using it to carry on our family tradition. So I've carried this around with me for, for decades. And his spirit is in here. It's inspired me for any of the stuff I've been doing because it's the same battle, the same enemy 250 years later, mm -hmm. church, state, big money, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so anyway, that's part of the story of how I across that so great i mean work of my ancestors, they, they've just right? been throwing books like that onto the fires for decades now <laughs> right the like you know coming oh, yeah. from state to the library ditch them out burn them <laughs> we'll carry this on we shall you can get it off amazon kevin anna or right uh angel fire 101 at protonmail.com or Murderbydecree.com. You can get a hold of it those ways. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Georgina.